Uh, anyway, we'll, the, uh, we'll make a short uh, introduction. I would say that uh, superconductors, spin liquids, topological materials, etc., are lots of uh, systems with emergent phenomena that are of interest uh, to us and pose very uh, difficult uh, challenges. So our speaker today has uh, worked on uh, basically all these uh, areas making uh, uh, important contributions. And I would say that uh, one of his uh, hallmark is that uh, he's been uh, using computational methods to shed light on this, uh, these uh, very difficult problems. at the same time, inventing new methods and uh, using uh, uh, well-known uh, ones. And uh, so um, he did his uh, PhD, uh, master's degree at the University of Waterloo with uh, Michel Gingras, and then his PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara with uh, Doug Scalapino. And he went on to a prestigious uh, um, postdoctoral uh, stay at Oak Ridge uh, uh, National Lab. I think it was a Wigner Fellowship, something like that. And he's a Canada Research Chair in Computational Quantum Anybody Physics at Waterloo and Associate Faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical uh, Physics and, uh, and also obviously Professor in the Department of uh, uh, Physics and Astronomy. I would say that uh, he is definitely uh, one of the top uh, people uh, in the world who have uh, pioneered the machine learning methods to help us understand the uh, a condensed matter. So it is a real pleasure for us today uh, to welcome uh, Roger Melko. Okay, thank you, Andre Marie. Let me share my screen. And hopefully this is working. There we go. So, uh, uh, yeah, Roger, thank you. Roger for yep. questions. Uh, do you mind being interrupted or you want the chat or you want me to moderate that? I or? can't, I won't monitor the chat, so yeah. Either Andre Marie, either you interrupt me directly, or anyone just can blurt out any sort of rude comment at any time. I promise I won't get flustered. So okay. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, okay, I'll get started. Yeah, and feel free to interrupt. Um, uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Andre Marie. Uh, my uh, my wife says I'm collecting too many affiliations, so I've listed them at the bottom uh, here. But my most important one is a visiting fellow at uh, IQ. On, but you know, I can't visit Institute Quantique right now, so maybe this counts in some sense. It's good to see a lot of you. Yeah, um, sort of a virtual visit, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, one thing I am doing with my spare time is helping Perimeter Institute launch an AI lab. So we call it the Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab. And it's really just the group of us condensed matter theorists and quantum information scientists uh, at Perimeter and sort of you know, loosely associated with Juan Carasquilla's group at the Vector Institute, uh, who, who are interested in using machine learning to advance, you know, our field, which is, you know, condensed matter and, and quantum information. And so the picture I'm showing here is, is, is the members of the lab, um, you know, at better times before the pandemic. And I've started adding people here uh, as the pandemic, you know, some people have been falling out of the group and moving on and some people have been adding. So just a few that I'll mention, Giacomo Torlai here, who did a lot of the work I'm gonna show on restricted Boltzmann machines, uh, was a student of mine, went to Flatiron CCQ, and now he's joining um, Preskill and Fernando at uh, AWS, uh, you know, quantum, quantum, new quantum computing effort, Amazon's quantum computing effort in Caltech. Uh, so a lot of the work that I'm talking about will be kind of adopted into their larger computational strategy. Um, other people you might recognize, uh, some of you, uh, um, as Stephanie Sischek is a new postdoc who's collaborating with uh, Dominique and Yan uh, the, uh, over there at Sherbrooke on neuromorphic circuits. Um, let's see, Jeremy Cote, uh, who was a PSI student, uh, who I now share with Stefanos. Uh, Victor, who's also in Dominic's group, and uh, some of the work from these uh, other people I'll mention as, as we go on. And by the way, Perimeter Institute Quantum Intelligence Lab, the acronym is PICL. And so I, I have an icon here for a couple students that like, since they've joined in the pandemic, I haven't even seen, and I don't have a picture of them. So it's amazing that we can still do work. 
So as Andre Marie alluded to, uh, you know, I'm interested in quantum many body systems. You know, I'm a condensed matter theorist uh, by trade, uh, but I've, I've branched out several times into sort of more quantum information related fields. And, you know, found it, I guess fundamentally one of the big questions I'm interested in is what makes, you know, solving quantum systems difficult for classical computers. Where's the divide between, you know, the simulation abilities of classical computers and sort of the simulation or emulation abilities of quantum computers. And I, you know, if you think of a, an information uh, complexity standpoint, you might ask kind of a fundamental question, well, where's the polynomial versus exponential sort of asymptotic scaling divide? And so we're motivated in condensed matter from uh, a lot of these sort of uh, prototypical systems like, like a Hubbard model or frustrated spin systems that we know are difficult to simulate. And by simulate, I mean, there's various things you can imagine, uh, but I typically work sort of in the, uh, in the paradigm of, you know, seeking ground states, properties of the ground states, low lying excitations, topological invariance and, and, and things like that. Although that, that, that's, that's not an exhaustive list, of course. So the complexity uh, that arises or the difficulty, let me just say, or the challenge in these types of systems when you're trying to solve for the ground state of say the Hubbard model uh, in, in, in various different manifestations uh, for various numerical techniques. So for example, we know diagonalization is an exponentially difficult uh, uh, sort of or ch exponentially challenging algorithm. Uh, even, even these sort of projective iterative versions like Lanchos or Davidson algorithms. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I do a lot of my work with sort of path integral or world line type quantum Monte Carlo methods uh, where, you know, the sign problem manifests and the sign problem gives you exponential, you know, exponentially uh, diverging variances in your uh, you know, estimators or something like that. So there's also an exponential there. Any, any sort of tensor network methods, DMRG, uh, uh, you know, PEPs have ex exponential difficulty in various aspects once you get past one dimension. So, you know, if you add an extra, if you, if you have a one dimensional system, you start building up a two leg ladder, you know, the bond dimension grows in some way, in, you know, which can give you exponential difficulty. And variational Monte Carlo, which we've been thinking about more and more recently, uh, you know, also has issues related to, you know, I, I guess finding sort of ground state, uh, ground states, which are manifest as minima of some optimization uh, function related to the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. So I'll come back to that. And as you as you look at these different methods, you say, okay, the complexity certainly comes from different. Uh, you know, it's manifest in different ways in these different methods. So different parts of the problem can give you kind of this exponential wall. And if we're lucky enough, we'll find, uh, you know, systems, either Hamiltonians or wave functions uh, that can be classified in a way, or that can be understood in a way such that we can devise algorithms that bypass this exponential difficulty, like a one dimensional DMRG. But in some cases, we just shuffle that exponential wall around. And it can manifest, you know, as, you know, in the wave function, very simply, it's sort of the number of, of, of like, you know, real parameters, if you will, required to represent a wave function. That's a common one. It could be also the fact that, you know, you can represent a wave function with an efficient compression algorithm, okay, which is in some sense what DMRG does. It compresses these indices uh, into something that scales polynomial, but you know, you could have a difficulty in finding the optimal parameters. And that's, that's typical of PEPs where uh, you might have an area law entanglement, you know, you might be able to represent the wave function, but you can't contract the indices. Or in a variational method, you might want to find the, the uh, global minimum. By the way, can you see my mouse? Yes. Yeah, sorry, it's not the best pointer. Uh, you might be you're looking for a, a global minimum, and that could be a difficult uh, uh, um, uh, prospect. Uh, so here's one of my students, actually, here's a lost landscape of a recurrent neural network wave function for the quantum XY model. I'll come back to this, but we, we encounter these types of problems quite a bit more often in machine learning uh, strategies. And if you're, I'm thinking of Monte Carlo or any types of type of uh, important sampling, uh, you know, there's a similar issue regarding the ergodicity of, of producing samples 
Uh, it's similar, but not entirely the same as, as sort of ergodicity problems that you can find in exploring rough landscapes like glasses. Uh, but, and even in the case where uh, you might be able to produce some samples, uh, even in some cases like quantum hardware, or quantum simulators, you can have an exponential difficulty in producing expectation values for physical observables that you want to learn. Uh, so, so again, there's many different places where uh, in, in quantum systems where these, these difficulties can arise. But we're in an interesting time now because, you, you know, we're, we're just getting to the, the, the kind of, uh, the, you know, this stage where the state of the art of quantum simulators, let me call them, or quantum emulators uh, are such that we can build, you know, uh, physical implementations of some of these difficult problems like the Hubbard model, you know, we can, uh, you know, the, the, the typical, uh, you know, the typical sort of way we think of a quantum simulator is, uh, you know, um, taking maybe trapped ions or cold atoms or something like that, something that's a highly controlled quantum, let me call it analog device, right? And tuning the interactions between the different atomic, whatever species, such that you can emulate the low energy, you know, physics that you're interested in, in something like the Hubbard model. So, you know, the, uh, the potential created by the ions and the interactions uh, can be tuned experimentally to give you uh, some sort of, you know, uh, you know approximate or, or accurate representation of, of uh, the model you're looking for. But this process of sort of verifying and characterizing the hardware itself presents a difficulty, right? And so you can, it's fair to ask the question about how hard is it to know what you prepared experimentally? And that's kind of what I'm talking about today. And the approach we're taking is, you know, we're measuring, uh, you know, we're taking projective measurements or more generalized measurements from quantum hardware that's been produced in a laboratory. And we're reconstructing in some sense, the state or the wave function or the, the density matrix. And we're probing that virtual reconstruction, which is what I'll talk about in order to give feedback back into the experiments to either help them with characterization, characterization or to suggest improvements or to really just suggest um, um, different ways of doing experiments and so on. So that's the practical uh, use of what I'm going to talk about. And, and theoretically, I think I'm also interested in sort of how our fundamental notions of complexity transfer to the case where we're no longer learning from a Hamiltonian, right? We're no longer defining the Hamiltonian and looking for the ground state. We're trying to reconstruct the ground state from data that's provided to us. So it's more true to sort of a quantum tomography type uh, um, um, philosophy. So I'll, I'll spend most of the talk uh, with what I would call sort of a, a, a gentle uh, introduction to how generative modeling, which is a strategy uh, that comes from unsupervised machine learning uh, can be used to reconstruct states uh, and it'll be mostly a classical perspective, uh, but I'll show you how the quantum nature of, of states and wave function leaks in. So just to start our thinking classically, uh, I think it helps to just imagine that we have a black box, which is our experiment. For me, it's an experiment. And that black box, it, you know, in, in the machine learning setting, uh, the black box is, uh, you know, people producing data on the internet, you know, pictures of cats and dogs or something like that. And, a, 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 you know, learning or uns, one task of unsupervised learning is to try to approximately learn a, a, a probability distribution that underlies a set of data. OK, and so I represented that probability distribution as living inside this black box. And what we have access to are, are instances of data. And I've, I've drawn them as vectors. Uh, which, uh, you know, are, are produced from that uh, black box uh, and, and which of which we have access to some finite number of. I always put 10,000 here because that's a typical size that's used in machine learning, you know, 1,000 to 10,000, you know, pictures of cats or something like that. So each one of these vectors is a picture of a cat and each zero or one is a black and white pixel. I haven't drawn it, but, you know, that's, that's the machine learning perspective. And in the quantum physics project perspective, this is an experiment. And the simplest way to think about these vectors are projective measurements. And the length of each vector is the number of qubits you have, right? And so this is the SZ state, or sorry, the SZ state or whatever of, of, a, of, a, of a spin, uh, spin one half qubit or something like that. Uh, 
So it, in, in both of these cases, you know, typically we're dealing with finite size data sets. You know, the experiments that we, uh, the experiment, experiments that we work on and we collaborate with, uh, you know, can produce some finite set of projective measurements for each uh, time the experimental system is prepared. And it's something between one and 10,000 typically uh, for qubit sizes of, you know, a, a, up to a dozen, maybe up to a hundred in the near future. So all we have access to is this data. And what we want to do is reconstruct the probability distribution. And the first thing you should say is, well, why don't we just use a frequency distribution, right? Where we just, you know, take the instances of the data and, and reconstruct an approximate uh, distribution based on the frequency. And the point is that you uh, can often have, say, a Hilbert space that's very large and a small, relatively small amount of data. And so some amount of modeling will benefit, uh, you, you know, your reconstruction. And so we're going to look at modeling. So it's called generative modeling because, you know, instead of reconstructing the frequency distribution, really what you're doing is you're fitting parameters of a model that you've already kind of biased uh, to take into account some of the information that you know about your system. That's kind of, and, and you know, this model should, uh, you know, hopefully give you a more faithful reproduction of the distribution that generalizes better, which means it, it generalizes better on unseen data. So I'm gonna use Lambda as, 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 as uh, specifying the parameters. And so the goal is to take that data and to tweak the parameters so that, uh, you know, the model distribution or the model under study uh, is, is as close as possible to the black box without knowing explicitly what's in the black box. And this is a, sort of an industry standard use case of, of what's called generative models, okay? And I'm gonna explain what generative models are, uh, but as, as I'm alluding to on these slides, we're gonna use typically some type of neural network, um, uh, some sort of stochastic neural network. And, and the simplest way to think about some of these things is just an Ising model. And I'll, and I'll also talk about some more advanced architectures called autoregressive models. And I'll explain the difference between these. So uh, RBMs are restricted Bolson machines, which I'll talk about next. Recurrent neural networks. I won't show too many pictures of a recurrent neural network, uh, but there's, they're a sequence-based architecture that's typically used for um, uh, sort of uh, uh, sequences of words. So either text completion or like natural language translation, where you feed into this recurrent network word one, or say word one, word two, word three, and it completes a sentence. Uh, what I'm gonna do is feed in qubit states. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you more about that. Autoregressive models are something we don't encounter too much in sort of the conventional um, uh, simulation suite uh, for quantum many body physics, but it's related to DMRG uh, in, in some sense. Uh, so why do we do, why do we bother to learn generative models? The point is that uh, we can, once the model is trained on the data that we have access to, we, it, we hope it generalizes well. So number one, we can generate new data samples. And from these data samples, we can calculate estimators. Okay. And I'll show you how that works. Or we can produce likelihoods for new measurements if that's what we want. And I'll, I'll also emphasize the difference in uh, producing estimators from autoregressive and non-autoregressive models. So I'm used to producing an estimator from something like a Monte Carlo method where you, you know, you produce samples and you calculate an expect, uh, estimator for uh, expectation value. Autoregressive models uh, have an additional property that they give you a normalized distribution. And I'll mention that several times. So the recurrent neural networks and the transformers give you, unlike sort of a, a, a Boltzmann, uh, you know, they give you basically a knowledge of the partition function or, or a, let me say a normalized distribution that allows you to draw independent samples. So I actually have a slide on that here. <clears throat> so if you're a novice in generative models, like basically I am and was for the last few years, it, it, it helps to kind of think about how generative models are organized in the machine learning literature. And Ian Goodfellow, who's the inventor of the uh, generative adversarial network, the GAN, uh, has, has kind of a nice hierarchy or taxonomy uh, as of 2017 in this paper. So, Generative models are trained via maximum likelihood, and I'll explain what that is. Okay, so maximum, you know, this is again the a data-driven philosophy. So we're not learning the ground state wave function with knowledge of the Hamiltonian, where we might do something like calculate the expectation value of 
the Hamiltonian and, and treat that like a variational energy and minimize that. We're not doing that. What we are is we're defining some maximum likelihood uh, cost function and minimizing that. Um, underneath that, uh, you know, branch of this tree are basically two different uh, uh, large sub branches, which are implicit density and explicit density. And the, 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 you know, essentially the difference between explicit and implicit is, is the idea that we have a, a, a track, a, a sort of, um, you know, parameterization directly of the probability distribution. Okay. So like we're interpreting the parameters in the model as giving us, um, uh, you know, a, a real P of X on, on the left-hand side. And this is what I'll be working with the explicit density branch. The implicit density branch are things like GANs. So GANs do not give you an explicit representation of a probability distribution or a wave function. So that's important. On the explicit density side, where I've parameterized my distribution, I can have tractable or approximate densities, which means I can exactly calculate uh, you know, the, the, uh, the probability or the likelihood or the density on the left-hand side. And I can't do it exactly or in a tractable manner on the right hand side. And this is the distinction I was talking about between um, sort of Markov chain based methods like the restrictive Boltzmann machine, which are more like Monte Carlo methods and the left hand side, which are more, which are these auto regressive methods, which are give you normalized distributions. Uh, so uh, recurrent neural networks, the transformers, a lot of these current uh, natural language processing methods uh, are on this left hand side. So I'll talk about two. I'll mostly talk about the restrictive Boltzmann machine, which occurs on the right-hand side. And I'll talk about that in the, the next slide. But really what the re restrictive Boltzmann machine is, is an implicit, uh, oh, sorry, is an explicit uh, density model that you can only sample approximately through Markov chain methods. And it's also an energy-based model, which basically means it's an Ising model. So it's an Ising model where the probability distribution, which you, explicitly represent is really just like a Boltzmann uh, distribution here. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, I'll talk mostly about recurrent neural networks. I'll show results for these. They look very different, but they serve almost the, entirely the same purpose as a generative model. So as I, as I move on and I give concrete examples of the restricted Boltzmann machine, just keep in mind there's other generative models which are um, uh, sort of used uh, in more modern applications. And the recurrent neural network, just to give you an idea about why it's a, what do they call them, a tractable density model, is, you know, in the RBM, I'll show you how these units represent the projective measurements of a quantum spin. In the RNN, we use the, you know, there's, a, there's like a cell, which has maybe a neural network inside of it, which I won't talk about. But we input uh, all of these qubits as, or these projective measurements as sequences, uh, at one after another. And there's a hidden state, uh, which also gets updated. And the output is the probability of the measurement outcome of the next spin in the sequence. So if I input the measurement outcome of spin I minus one, what the RNN gives you is the conditional probability of the output of the next spin on the chain conditioned on the previous spins. And I mean, I don't want to dwell on this, but the point is that, uh, you know, you can you can specify the joint distribution or the full wave function uh, using this chain rule property, uh, which, which basically multiplies all the outputs of these RNN cells and gives you a normalized distribution. So having a normalized representation of a wave function is much more powerful than having an unnormalized one on the right-hand side where you don't know uh, the partition function. So that's why we like that class of generative model. <clears throat> So I'm going to back up now. So if you didn't get that, fine. I just I'll, I'll let me let me back up to the RBM because I think the restricted Boltz machine is sort of the easiest way to understand uh, kind of the 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 uh, methodology behind uh, learning uh, with with any of these generative models. And the RBM is based on uh, a, an Ising model representation of uh, uh, you know it was associative memories uh, worked on by John Hopfield. So John was Bert Halperin's advisor and I think Steve, Steve Gervin's advisor. So basically a condensed matter physicist, you know, invented this whole field. And the Hopfield network, which I won't show has, you know, some, I would call them almost technical 
problems with learning, which were solved by Jeff Hinton and others uh, by, by turning this uh, architecture into the restrictive Bolson machine. So let me get into a bit more detail. So an RBM, which I've illustrated here, has what I'm saying N, what I'm calling visible units. Okay, and each one of these is a, as a binary variable, just an Ising spin, which in principle you take the input of the projective measurements of the qubits, or they take the pixel values of the image. And these are connected to an, another set of Ising spins, okay, in, in what's called the hidden layer uh, by what we call weights, but are really just the Ising couplings. So they're energy based in the sense that we define an energy between X is visible, H is hidden, and here's just the Ising interaction. So that's your, your interaction matrix. And then there's two, you know, magnetic fields, which we call biases. So these are called weights and biases in the machine learning lingo. And an important thing to note is that the hidden number of hidden units can be changed. So the visible units are fixed to the number of qubits in your experiment, but the number of hidden units you vary in order to give you more you know, representational power or what they say, what they would say in machine learning is more expressivity. So if you want a more expressive machine, you have more hidden units. And just one note is that really the hidden units aren't physical. You know, that's their, their, their uh, you know, the, the physical layer is what we call visible. And so what we're really after is the marginal probability distribution where we've traced out the hidden units in the end. So what we want to do is we want to learn, that's the machine learning part, all the weights and biases uh, that give us a good representation of the marginal distribution so that it matches what's in that black box, okay? Any questions on the architecture? Yeah, just can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah, um, so the H's, they seem kind of, if I look at the energy functional, they look like what I would think is an effective mean field uh, that every spin faces, but they're a lot more than the actual number of spins. So is there a way of maybe then instead of saying, taking a lot more of these, instead, can I you know, generalize mean field couplings between spins and things like this? So to make yeah, it so the, a bit more physical, maybe. You, you can essentially, um, so I drew, I, drew there as being, I drew it as being more hidden units, but the number depends on, on essentially a lot, the features of the, let's say, wave function you're trying to learn. So if you're trying to learn something gapped versus critical, those numbers and the, the way the hidden units scale is very different. Uh, so there are some simple cases, like something like a, you know, like a Z2 gauge theory, or even a classical Ising model where you know how to do an exact mapping of this representation. Actually any string bond state or any uh, string net state maybe, um, people know how to do these mappings like you're saying exactly. So that's, that's definitely true that you can, um, you can perform, you know, you can perform, you can understand this as some sort of mean field coupling. We keep it more general and we just try to learn the, the sort of, uh, you know, the association between hidden and, and, and and visible units. So we try to learn that from the data. And, and maybe at some point you could come back to the, um, I guess you will talk about this, maybe thermodynamic limit and how many, I mean, do you need how this number of hidden unit scales vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a gapless versus gap theory? Yeah, I have data for that. Um, so I can I can show you if I get time, but or, or I can show you after we talk about questions. That's a really, that's a really interesting point, yeah. yeah. So let me just say that also this is like a generalized sort of hubbard stokhanovich transformation, really. That's another way of thinking about this. So that's a restricted Bolton machine. This was a workhorse of deep learning before convolutional neural networks took everything over in 2012-ish. So these used to be generative pre-training. They used to take the hidden units and, and send the hidden unit outputs into classification like neural networks, like, um, but they don't do that anymore. Uh, sorry, Roger, just yep. a quick question on the previous slide. So how do I use this machine? Do I think of the axis as measurements that I know? And I'm trying to construct the wave function? Yeah, yes. So I'm going to talk about that now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so the measurements that you know go into the visible units. And what this thing is, is a representation of the wave function. Okay, but a, a representation of the wave function, which is related to the marginal distribution. So just keep that in mind. You have to trace out the hidden units. So let's talk about that. So first off, what does it mean to train a generative model, right? So uh, training means uh, adjusting all those weights and biases. So it's like we have an Ising model, 
and we want the Ising model to represent some other, you know, some distribution that's in a black box. And we have to adjust all the couplings and, and fields and everything. So how do we do that? Okay, so first off again, just to emphasize, we marginalize out in principle uh, the, the distribution and we wanna match that to the target distribution. So I've illustrated the target black box distribution here. And, and we imagine just you know, schematically that the uh, restrictive Boltzmann machine represents some distribution or models some distribution that doesn't maybe perfectly match, especially if we just start with a bunch of random couplings. So this is where the maximum likelihood point comes in is that we have to define an optimization problem with this. And there's different ways of doing this, but a common one is to use the callback Leibler divergence. So they call it KL divergence. And so really it's, it's like a relative entropy. Uh, here's the KL divergence. It's like a distance between these two distributions, although it's not a symmetric distance. Uh, so, you know, trace over visible P, which you don't know explicitly log P over P lambda. And of course, if the distributions matched exactly, like if you got perfect training, this thing would be zero, okay? But really what you have to do is break it into two parts. You get the entropy of the data set, which is a constant. You throw it away in principle because you don't, you know, it doesn't depend on the parameters. And then if you look at this expression, what you'll see is you can write it as the expectation value of log of P lambda, right? Calculated with X use samples that have been sampled from the distribution P. So that's the standard formulation of an estimator. And so you can see what you can do is you can calculate an estimator and it's, it's only part of this, you've thrown away a constant and, and it's equivalent to, I think I threw the minus sign away. So it's maximizing this object, which they call the log likelihood. So if you can maximize the log likelihood, which is an estimator that you can calculate, right? If you have this marginal distribution at any instantaneous time, uh, you know, in terms of uh, sets of parameters, then you could make these two distributions match. Okay, and so that, that's what defines these loss landscapes that we work in. And then the question is, how do you update the parameters and you know, completely standard gradient descent or one of its variants like Adam or something is what's typically used here. So you're really just updating parameters based on, uh, you know, calculating the gradient of this thing, uh, with, you know, which is, okay, there's various details about that, like how, you know, how that works. There's a hyperparameter called the learning rate, uh, but really what we're trying to do is update the lambdas. That's learning, got it? Once you've learned, you can now generate. So again, the point is that you parameterize the distribution so that hopefully it's, you know, even though you have a limited data set, like a couple thousand projective measurements from the experiment, hopefully, you know, the, the model that you've, you've created can generalize well and produce all sorts of new configurations. And the simplest thing to imagine doing with these configurations is just calculating expectation values, okay? And we'll get back to why you wanna do this. And I just want to point out again that if I if I just sample, uh, you know, um, okay, what? I mean, like, if I just sample this machine to produce uh, visible and hidden configurations, uh, and again, they're they're unnormalized because I don't know the partition function, so I have to do some sort of Markov chain based method, like we use some sort of Gibbs sampling method, which gives these estimators autocorrelation functions. Okay, and one of the prime one of the the most important advantages of autoregressive models where we have the normalized distribution is that we can really produce samples without any uh, any autocorrelation okay so that's that's the impetus behind a lot of this work being done on recurrent neural networks and transformers and so on so i don't know an equivalent method in kind of conventional condensed matter simulation that's auto that has, supports autoregressive sampling except for you know, DMRG type methods. So DMRG, you can produce normalized samples or, you know, is normalized, you can produce independent samples from. So just quickly to show you how this works for, you can do this for a classical, you know, the first thing we did was a classical Ising model, you know, 2D Ising model. You feed in a whole bunch of, I think that, yeah, this is a 64 uh, size, N equals 64 size Ising model. You feed configurations from that black box, which is a Monte Carlo program, you know, into the restricted Bolson machine and you look at estimators like the energy, specific heat, magnetization, susceptibility as a function of temperature. And you get an idea for how 
you know, different amounts of hidden units give you dis different expressive power. So the exact, you know, uh, um, the exact energy or specific heats in black. And you can see that if I have four hidden units for 64 visible units, uh, I don't get an accurate specific heat. But if I have 16 and eventually 64 hidden units, um, you know, you'll, you'll basically converge to the uh, exact, uh, ex exact value. And so you can, you can see how the number of hidden units increases, you know, you increase it, you increase the expressive power of the machine. And what you could also ask is how does that scale? And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay. But so that's kind of how you, you know, you learn the representational power. Just go back to quantum mechanics. Um, I don't have, I, 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 uh, I have about 10 more minutes of slides here, I think. So I'll, I'll start going quicker on some results. So in quantum states, you know, okay, I can represent the wave function as the root square root of the distribution if I don't have a phase and that's fine. So everything that I'm talking about can be translated uh, to this, what I call classical case. In the, in the case where you can assume a priori that the wave function has no sign structure or no phase excuse me, structure. Excuse me, Roger. Yep. Uh, Rude the interruption. No, uh, no, no. We have a question regarding the previous uh, slide uh, or even the one before, but the, the question is RDH obtained by optimization or are they guess? I guess you get them from optimization, right? Are the one obtained? The the H in the restricted Boltzmann machine. The H are variables, so the 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 H are not parameters. Uh, the weights biases. So I have two different biases: one that's on the visible, one that's on the hidden. But the weights and biases are the parameters. The the H's are stochastic variables, so they're Ising variables, and they don't have to be fixed. So they're sampled. So the, the parameterization occurs only through the edges of this graph or the weights of this graph. And so what happens is the machine, you know, if it was trained is a set of weights and biases uh, and you can start it with an initial X and an initial H, but that puts it up here, you know? And so you might have to, oh no, sorry, that's not the wrong interpretation. It puts it, you know, you have to warm it up. It's like a, if you do a Monte Carlo simulation and you have to warm it, warm it up and let it equilibriate and it fluctuates around equilibrium. You have to equilibrate these parameters, so they're not trained. Other questions? So every time you, uh, uh, let's say, you do uh, this uh, gradient descent, uh, you have to uh, sample a lot of these uh, these edges, right? Right. Yep. Exactly. Because you need to calculate the marginal distribution, right? So mm -hmm. you need to you know, think about how this object is, is traced out. So you, so you basically have to, you know, in principle, if you want this exactly, you have to produce enough H samples so that you can, you can trace out uh, the, those hidden variables. In practice during training, uh, this is done with a very small number of samples. When you, you know, have just four, um, four I suppose uh, four, four uh, hidden layers, then you could do it exactly right, for example. Yeah, if it's, yeah, you can do this and yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Okay, so that, that illustrates another, another, you know, this is, this is in the training. These are details that we, you know, we work on quite a bit, but, but yeah, so like all, there's all sorts of tricks and approximations that go into calculating these marginals during training, calculating these gradients. You don't do it on the full data set. You do it on a mini batch. Uh, and really it's like a fight, you know, this is what Jeff Hinton figured out. It's like a balance between you know, the intractability of calculating things like these, the, these marginal distributions versus how accurate you really need them in training. So I, I'm kind of glossing over all that machine learning, um, you know, yeah, magic. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so that, you know, we'll, it, the proof's in the pudding. If it works, it works. If we don't get a good uh, ground state, you know, ground state variables, you can ask, did the machine, you know, was it successful in training or not? And so when I show you some results, keep that in mind. So let me just mo mention that, you know, learning, uh, learning a classical distribution is the same as learning a wave function in many cases, in particular in those cases that we consider stochastic, to abuse the, that word. Um, so stochastic Hamiltonians uh, have exclusively negative off-diagonal matrix elements, right? 
And so by the parent Frobenius theorem, the extramal you know, eigenvectors are all real and positive, which means the ground state wave function is, has no phase or sign structure. And so if, if we a priori know that we have a stochastic Hamiltonian, then the reconstruction is very simple. If we don't have that, then we really have to learn the phase of the wave function. And that I'll show you how we do that. It's also possible. And you know, for experiments, you also have to think of not just pure states, but mixed states. And so we can also learn density matrices. So the technology that I'm showing you has advanced to the point where we can reconstruct density matrices. Um, uh, but I'll, I'm just gonna show you most of the um, results on, on, on these classical or stochastic Hamiltonians, okay? So why would you, oh, yeah, I'll show you the next slide. Um, so let's just do the case study. So the experiment we first worked on was um, uh, built by Manuel Andres during his postdoc in, in Misha Lukin's lab at Harvard. Uh, and so uh, it's essentially this Rydberg atom Hamiltonian. So just to make a long story short, Rydberg atoms, you load them in a lattice, they exist in a ground state or a highly excited Rydberg state. And those Rydberg states have some repulsion based on the lattice spacing here, okay, which can be adjusted. So this, it's like Coulomb repulsion, but it's Rydberg, well, Rydberg blockade, that's what they call it. So this blockade can give you all sorts of interesting phases. And actually Matthew, uh, sorry, Sabir Sachev has an interesting paper about this transition to the Z3 phase. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so the Rydberg Hamiltonian is basically a transfer field Ising model. I got the sign wrong here, but this, if this sign's negative, uh, which is possible through a local unitary, so it's no problem. Uh, then this is a stochastic Hamiltonian. So there's detuning uh, and N is the occupation of the Rydberg state, right? So if you have, you know, you know this VIJ, which, you know, is, is some dipolar like coupling depending on lattice spacing and so on. So you have Rydberg state, you have ground states, it's a two state system. Uh, the data that we can get from experiments is like, these are, I just cut these from the paper. Uh, so a dot is a fluorescence in the, in the ground state. The absence of a black dot is a Rydberg state. So you can get your zero or ones, you can get a vector that's perfect for this type of generative modeling machine learning. Why do we care? I mean, you got the data, it's, there's only one basis. Why do you wanna do a generative model? So what's kind of fun is that, you know, of course you can calculate diagonal uh, expectation values, but because you have an explicit, you know, explicit density generative model or an, a, an explicit parameterization of the wave function, they can use these tricks like we use in variational Monte Carlo to calculate things like any off diagonal um, observables or the expectation value of any off diagonal um, operators based on these local estimator tricks. So, you know, we have access to the local estimator and as long as that's a, a sparse object, then it's the local density uh, estimator um, calculation is, is tractable. So here's just a plain Jane transverse field Ising model. Um, this is, Transverse field, here's uh, restricted Bolson machines are the colors. We've trained off DMRG or quantum Monte Carlo data. This is 2D. Uh, here's the Sigma Z magnetization. Here's the Sigma X. And the Sigma X is difficult to calculate in any QMC coded in the, in the, in the Sigma Z basis, as you might know. And so you have to code a QMC in, a, in the X basis to show that this works. I'll talk about entanglement entropy um, on, on, on the next slide but we can access and we know that we can train these machines based off synthetic data that I obtained from say the transverse field Ising model using DMRG or quantum Monte Carlo. So that's how we benchmark all of this machine learning stuff as we feed it synthetic data. Here's a Rydberg atom experiment, you know, so there's the detuning happens as a function of time. They go from, they can prepare a system in the ground state and then they can get like, you know, uh, data from the Z2 state so depending on when they stop and do the measurement, they can traverse the, oops, they can traverse the phase diagram. They gave us 3000 projective measurements. So I like to pretend that the neural network is right there in the experiment, but they just emailed us this data. And so you get 3000 measurements on, I'm gonna show data for nine, eight or nine Rydberg atoms. And so you can ask, is that enough data? Um, and we assume purity and positivity of the wave function. So that's a priori input. That's why we use the RBM. And then we train and sample. And here's the, here's the generative sampling after training. 
So this is nine atoms. So you can diagonalize the Rydberg Hamiltonian to get the sigma. Sorry, this is I use the spin language. This is the di this is the diagonal magnetization or the Rydberg occupation uh, magnetization. Uh, so it goes from you know fully occupied in the ground state, I guess, to uh, unoccupied as a function of detuning. And here's the experiment, which is black. So because you're you know that's the computational basis, you can just calculate this magnetization in the experiment. And here's our reconstructed RBM that's been sampled and everything matches. And so what's really interesting is the experiment doesn't have direct access to the in-plane magnetization, sigma x. Um, and, but we can compare what the RBM reconstructs using the local estimator you know, from the diagonal basis. So we take the, we take the, you know, the computational basis, the Rydberg basis data, we train the restricted Boltzmann machine, and then we can produce the uh, in-plane um, uh, you know, uh, off diagonal magnetization from that. And these discrepancies are what we're looking for because this goes, this shows us that there's some, something that not quite right with the model, or there's something that, you know, Misha and, and Manuel have to tune in their experiment, right? Or it means that our, our training isn't working, but on this size, we're pretty confident about our, our training. And let me just also mention that the, you know, the restricted bolts machine is, as powerful as any variational wave function. So I can do things like these replica tricks. So I, I replicate the system and I can calculate the second Rennie entropy and I can compare the second Rennie entropy. Here's, you know, different cuts. It's not, a, doesn't really matter as a function of detuning. And I can compare what the model, you know, the exact, the Rydberg Hamiltonian gives me versus the reconstructed uh, restricted Bolson machine. Okay, so you can get access to all sorts of these estimators in, in sort of a very straightforward and easy way, uh, you know, from these generative models. And, and I think that's, that's one of the points of doing this, right? And at some point, uh, I'll show you scaling later, but we know that we can train generative models on these types of Hamiltonians uh, for hundreds or, may, you know, maybe up to a thousand roughly um, Rydberg atoms. And at that point, you're not going to have any exact diagonalization, obviously, right? So we're going to be able to take experimental data from the uh, the Rydberg setup and, and basically produce them, you know, plots of the off-diagonal magnetization, whatever two-point function you want, even things like these entanglement entropies. Um, so yeah, just to talk a bit more about how do you extend this past, you know, stochastic Hamiltonians. Uh, so it's certainly possible. Uh, the way we do it in a restricted Boltzmann machine is to, okay, so now here's my visible layer. I have uh, hidden units that represent the amplitude. And I have another set of hidden units that represent the phase. And so there's, you know, you can just parameterize the phase uh, in, in some scheme like this. Uh, another way that Giuseppe Carleo does it with, uh, is to basically have complex parameters uh, as weights. So that's another way of doing it. Then you don't need this additional hidden layer. Uh, there's some subtle difference between those, um, but that's not the main, I don't think kind of difficulty. The main difficulty is sort of this, you know, informational complete problem that comes in tomography, which you might be familiar with. You know, you can't just train this on data from a single basis anymore. You need in principle informationally complete set of bases to, to, to train the data. So what happens now is you have to have an experiment which can produce data in, in the number of bases required, whatever that is. So you have to have basis settings, you know, maybe you flip a couple uh, adjacent, you know, um, orientations. So that there's a number of bases, which is another sort of, if you want to call it hyperparameter that affects the scaling of this. And what we do is we basically loop over that number of bases and define a callback Leibler divergence or a, a log likelihood uh, for every single one of those. So we, we have to know the experimental setting. We know the unitary that rotates the wave function. And then we can turn this thing into another you know, classical problem where we just train this thing um, using, using the same techniques that I talked about. So it's just an extended cost function uh, that takes it, the unitary rotations into account. And that works fine. Um, you can ask subtle questions about these architectures. Is it easier to train the amplitude or the phase? And it's always easier to train the amplitude. So the phase, you know, you can have difficulty there, but it's not clearly mapped out. 
it does work. Uh, okay, I forget how many spins or atoms this is, uh, but this is uh, rib, this is time evolution of a Rydberg system that's undergoing some sort of Rabi oscillation. I forget why. Oh, it's quenched. That's why from a Z two state at t equals zero. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, and every single one of these points here is is a, a separate restrictive Volsa machine trained to have the phase, the complex phase that's accumulating as part of the time evolution. We can even calculate the growth of entanglement here. Okay, so you can, at some point, your machine might require more hidden units, right? It just makes sense. If your entanglement's growing, you might need more parameters, uh, but there's nothing stopping these types of architectures, um, uh, certainly from, from learning uh, phases, okay? And also you can experiment or fool around with the, the amount of bases required, right? So here we use two N plus one bases. So the number of bases for this Hamiltonian doesn't appear to need to grow exponentially. And that's, so that's something that, uh, you know, you, you, you have to, exp you know, you have to fool around with. You can extend it to density matrices. Uh, a simple way of doing it is with a purification. You just, here's visible, here's the two hidden units for the amplitude and phase. You purify that with the ancillary or the environment. Um, you know, I won't bore you with how that works. That's almost the same thing as I've been talking about. Um, you know, again, you need to have all sorts of additional uh, data to make sure your information is complete. But uh, I think a more sophisticated way of doing it is actually to decouple the classical statistical model, the generative model from the phase and sign structure. And so this is something that we've been working on very closely with Juan Karaskia. And it, it, you know, it's, it's basically this, this POVM decomposition um, of, 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 of your density matrix, if you will. Uh, so I'm not gonna get into it, but I think the, 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 the smart way of, of decomposing a density matrix is into a generative model that's classical and now we don't need to use something complicated. We can just use straight off the shelf RBMs or any of these recurrent models uh, or sort of autoregressive models. And then that's coupled to a tensor network decomposition of the POVM, which I haven't detailed. I've just kind of illustrated it here with a tensor network diagrams. So all the phase and sign structures encoded in the tensor networks and all of the, if you will, entanglement structure is encoded in the generative model. And that thing can remain completely classical um, but you still have to, you need measurements in these bases, okay? So that's difficult for Rydberg systems. We're working on this more with the trapped ion people. So Rajval Islam here at Waterloo at IQC has a nice experiment going where he's, uh, you know, trapping um, the terbium ions and producing, you know, he can do arbitrary basis rotations and give us projective measurement data or POVM uh, data from these things. And I just wanted to show you, this is my last slide, I just wanna show you one amazing thing that the recurrent neural networks can do. So without talking too much about exactly how this works, um, you can actually reconfigure the recurrent neural networks um, so that you take a time sequence, which is what they're originally meant for. So this is single ion Rabi flop data, okay? And here's the four POVM measurements, or you know, it's, you, I, could, I could have shown the, four elements of the density matrix, both, both the real and imaginary parts, you, that you can reconstruct that. You know, the, this, this is in, invertible if you do this equation correctly. Um, and so what the gray is, is that we've trained this on a time sequence of, of POVM data. Uh, and then after the gray, we've asked the recurrent neural network to complete the sentence. You know, it's like if you go to talk to transformer and you type in, you know, the start of a sentence, it completes the sentence. It's like text completion. So you can do text completion, which is essentially the same as asking this thing to predict the time evolution of the system past the point that it's been trained. And if you can get enough data to encompass enough of the, you know, variation of these cycles here, uh, then this thing is, so the, the dots are the RNN and the lines are the, the, the theory, you know, you can reproduce exactly the Rabi flop data that comes from these single ions. And this is a this is an extremely simple setup numerically. I mean, this is almost straight off the shelf uh, recurrent neural networks. So they're very powerful. Uh, we're basically adapting these autoregressive models more and more to the multi-qubit systems uh, that give us, uh, I'd say, access to interesting measurements.
Um, that's it. We use we use generative models all the time now. Uh, they're simple and powerful. Um, you know, we're we're tr not trying to reinvent the tomography wheel uh, because we we put a lot of a priori assumptions into the structure of. It's more like a condensed matter approach. We we assume a lot about either the Hamiltonian or the structure of the wave function, which helps us really uh, optimize the architecture of these generative models. Okay, so you know theoretically it's different than tomography in the sense that we're uh, we're assuming quite a bit, right? But I mean, if you're going to scale these kind of reconstruction methods or these tomographic-like methods up to hundreds of ions, and I mean, Misha showed me data for a 20 by 20 Rydberg array, so he can give us data for 400 atoms right now. I've seen other Rydberg systems that are getting close to that size. And you know how big the trapped ions are getting there and getting up to similar sizes. The point with this strategy is that you know with with these types of assumptions and these optimizations that a lot of which are inspired by machine learning we hope to be able to reconstruct data from the biggest simulators that are going to um, come out in the next few years there's a lot of theoretical questions which maybe i just don't understand but have that have to do with the complexity of this reconstruction so I feel like I have a pretty good handle on the landscape of complexity that I showed in the first couple slides for learning ground states from a Hamiltonian. I mean, we've been doing this stuff for decades, but now we're asking, you know, how do the parameters of the machine scale? Uh, you know, how do the number of hidden units is kind of the RBM way? How does that scale? Is it polynomial? Are the number of measurements required per basis polynomial? So that's the sample complexity and are the number of bases polynomial? And if any one of these is exponentially growing, you know, we're stuck back to where we are with, with, these, problem, with these difficult problems in, in the Hamiltonian sense. So I think there's a lot of this kind of, uh, it's still being mapped out. And then my final point is that something I think is interesting is, is how, are the, you know, how are the optimizations from data, if I take the same RBM or RNN and I try to variationally optimize it, which I didn't talk about, but what a lot of people do, with knowledge of the Hamiltonian versus optimizing it with experimental data, those are different cost functions. One, one could be the expert, you know, one's the energy, the variational energy, one's the KL divergence. If I have something that's glassy and it's difficult to optimize, uh, you know, in one setting, does it mean, does that glassiness translate to the other setting or that difficulty? And I think that's another interesting uh, point that we can pursue in the future. Okay, I'm right out of time, I think. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, really enlightening uh, talk. There is a, a question from um, Kartiek. Uh, go ahead, Kartiek. Yeah, uh, thanks for the nice talk, uh, Roger. So I had a question regarding um, the slide when you showed uh, Misha's experiment. Could you go back there? Uh, maybe this one or this one? Uh, yes, say the, the one before this. Um, right, so so I found the, yeah, the sigma x uh, plot particularly interesting because it shows that there is a distinction, at least uh, from the predictions between ED and what you're predicting. So I think this begs the natural question, can, okay, so suppose, first of all, of, uh, did, did they do the experiment and, and, and see whether it's closer to your uh, RBM results or, or ED or not? Probably not. Otherwise, you'd be showing us. So they did fix some of this discrepancy, I think, in the published version. Uh -huh. um, this is, so, I mean, the way the paper was written wasn't like, okay, let's examine the feedback between the RBM and the experiment. That, but that's what happened in real life. So this is not the final plot. This is actually one that showed a discrepancy. I think there was a, uh, I can't remember what it was, but there might've been an asymmetric error channel um, that they hadn't accounted for. So we actually, I glossed over that, but you know, you can have a, you can have a Rydberg state that's mistaken for a uh, ground state with a different probability than, the, than vice versa. And I think there was a discrepancy there that they, you know, after we looked at this, that they found. So again, I think if you look at the published version, you'll see that these match a bit closer, but that's one of those, you know, in some sense, it's like the experimental detail 
that you always encounter when you're doing experiments. But on the other hand, it's good to know that we helped, I think, resolve some of the discrepancy. Right. So, okay. So, so maybe this uh, case is, is a little different, but um, taking that further, I mean, suppose, uh, you know, they do an experiment, it's not exactly ideal and they can't really figure it out either. So is somehow the machine learning approach, can, can I now read from this or some of these plots, can I get back maybe what error term they have in the Hamiltonian or what non-Hermitian process they have. I mean, because that would really make this whole circle complete where machine learning is actually teaching us back, in teaches, teaching us something about the physics um, instead of actually being able to predict things. Yeah, I don't see, I mean, a simple way is if you can simulate aspects of the experiment, you know, you can put error models into your, and we do this all the time with Ragible. You put error models into your data, you know, and you produce synthetic data and you watch the behavior of the machine and, and so on. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a systematic way of basically, I would say, identifying error models directly from the data. Although I don't think there's any reason why you couldn't, have, you couldn't think about doing that. Yeah. It'd be much more sophisticated, but, you know, you can ask what's the error channel that's giving you this in the experiment. So if you're completely confident in the experiment, and again, there's some assumptions here, like we assume purity when it's not perfectly pure and there's some asymmetric error channels and so on. You know, I, I think it's it's challenging to back that out kind of systematically. It's much easier to do it in the way that I think condensed matter people are used to just, you know, heuristically doing it. So I think this really now is a powerful heuristic tool, but there's no reason you couldn't formalize it more. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I mean, you could take the, you know, the best error models that you think uh, describe the system, uh, do the same thing with your RBM or RNN and ask, you know, how the results change. And then you can say, okay, this is probably what's happening in the experiment. Now that would be, I think, very nice, actually. Yeah, absolutely. That's, there's, that's absolutely, we train all this stuff on synthetic data now, because as you can imagine, essentially everything that the experimentalists can do, I think almost can be, can be simulated now with conventional techniques. So we're still characterizing the machine learning aspect of this thing. And we're hoping that, you know, once this point comes where the, you know, fermionic covered model is produced um, in some, in some, in some experiment that we can't is, which is bigger than what we can simulate, then we can take that data and start doing this stuff and hopefully give meaningful feedback. Right. Cool. Thanks. Okay. More questions. Okay. I have a, I have a question. Uh, the um, I, I sort of uh, I understand that why machine learning works at all is because the, for example, the data like dogs and cats sort of uh, or faces live on sort of a manifold that is a subset of all possible, um, you know, realization of these uh, pixels. Now in uh, quantum mechanics, I think uh, David Poulin was one of those who worked on. On this, didn't he uh, show that the, the ground state of uh, Hamiltonians with nearest neighbor uh, interactions or you know short range interactions lives on a rather small subset of the whole Hilbert space? So is that one of the reasons that these machine learning uh, methods uh, work for quantum mechanics? Yeah, absolutely, and. You know, I think if you think back to how we understand even our conventional simulation techniques, like, you know, DMRG or tensor networks, I'd say are an analogy to this. You know, we know that wave functions in general, like ground state wave functions, live in a, in a small corner of Hilbert space uh, that obeys the area law. And so what tensor networks are is they're, you know, they're putting that area law scaling as an onsots into the wave function representation. And, you know, you could think about, yeah, you know, you think you know, that gives you an advantage because now you have a polynomial representation. Whereas if you had to, you know, think of a general, uh, if you pull the general state out of your spectrum, that could be generally uh, volume law. So we don't, you know, necessarily make that same assumption here. When I think about a restricted Boltzmann machine, I let it, I'm letting it be fully connected. So in principle, an RBM can capture longer range entanglement. In practice, what happens is 
many of these weights get pruned down uh, into some, you know, some smaller or some more appropriate scaling uh, um, um, number that scales. And it's not as easy to interpret, you know, why that happens, I would say. So if you, you know, I can't say that that necessarily corresponds to the corner Hilbert space that is low entanglement, but you know, you're completely right. And I think the point is that we're searching for what are the features that, that, you know, that, you know, in the machine or what are, you know, how do we interpret the physical features uh, in terms of, of what you're saying? So why are some, you know, problems easy where, you know, what distinguishes them from other problems in, in the, in the larger Hilbert space. I think very generally, this is a way to explore that question. You can say why, you know, why does an RBM learn a certain type of wave function better than a tensor network or vice versa? And you might get some intuition for exactly what I think David was saying. Okay, thank I don't know you. if that answered your question, sorry. Thank you very much, yeah. So there's another question from uh, Eli Genois. Uh, yes, I had a question. Thank you very much for your nice talk, it was great. Um, so I had a question when uh, regarding uh, learning a, a quantum state using a RNN. So okay. when I think of an RNN, I think of a sequential data. But um, right. like, how do you make sense of feeding, let's say, a spin or a qubit before another? So isn't your estimator biased in that sense? So no, but it's not obvious. So this is the most, this is the, the first thing when we start using RNNs that uh, is, is like, isn't quite obvious, I would say. And, and you're totally right to ask, that's a great question. So, so what I'm doing here, uh, if, for an example, is I'm feeding in a spin configuration into the recurrent cell. Uh, actually what happens is the hidden state is output, goes through a soft max, gives me a conditional, I should have, you know, gives me this conditional distribution, okay? So maybe this is a better way of seeing it. So here's a spin instance, here's like an up or down or a one or a zero, fed into here, a hidden state's output goes through the softmax, gets me this conditional distribution, and it's spin, it's, you know, the probability of spin, the next spin, I, being up, conditioned on everything before it. So it looks like you're biasing that, which is what you're saying. It looks like, okay, well, you know, that sequence is arbitrary. If I have a two-dimensional lattice, how do I define that sequence of I minus one I, you know, and you get into this thing that happens in two-dimensional DMRG of mapping uh, you know, two-dimensional lattices into one-dimensional sequences. So the point is that this equation that relates the joint distribution to the product of all the conditionals is exact, okay? So it doesn't matter what the sequence order is in here. And if I, if I rearrange the sequence, then this still holds, okay? So I could, I could it, the sequence definition is arbitrary, but... Okay, you are right in the sense that um, there is some truncation of correlations in some sense. So the hidden vector, which is passed between these different uh, recurrent cells, um, actually, they're always the same. Ws are the same. So really, you're feeding its head back into its tail. These hidden units are of finite size, and they can also be affected by things like forgetting forget gates, like in an LSTM. Okay, and what those gates... And, and the, the restricted size of the hidden units do is make it so that the correlations uh, in, in, you know, in these sequences uh, can only be felt so far back in, in time or so far back in the sequence. And in an LSTM, that's an exponentially decaying correlation. So in that sense, you can, in, yes, you can bias uh, your results based on this sequence, um, uh, but it has to do with the internal structure of the RNN, okay? And the transformer gets by this supposedly. So when I mentioned transformers versus RNNs, the transformers use what's called an intention mechanism. So it's still autoregressive, but the uh, it's not a one-dimensional kind of correlation function, uh, which dictates uh, uh, how accurate the, this learning is. It, it's a different, completely different mechanism. So I should have put a reference, but Juan Kierski and other people at Vector of, of and Una Kim actually in Cornell have looked quite a bit at uh, these these attention-based mechanisms, these these transformers, to kind of get by that fundamental bias that comes in in an RNN. Thanks. Nice. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions?
Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Roger for this very clear and stimulating, uh, stimulating talk. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I guess uh, please uh, don't uh, disconnect everyone else except those who are supposed to speak to you now will uh, will uh, will disconnect.